My name is Sam Williamson, and I am joined by Gary Barkalo, who's going to be on, you'll see his face in a few minutes, and by John Hard. And John is monitoring the comments so he can report them to us so we can answer the questions. Um, Gary, John, and I have been doing these podcasts for eight years together, mostly about calling, but also about hearing God, about risk, about living the Christian life. And we just felt nudged by God to um, bring this to a broader audience. And so this is our first night doing this on Facebook Live. And we want to encourage your participation because we really do believe we can uh, create community together as we share, as we talk, just conversational style. So I'm going to introduce Gary in just a minute, but I want to just give a quote from his book where he quoted somebody else that I just love. In Gary's book, he said, he's quoting God, Oz Guinness, and Oz Guinness said, calling is the most comprehensive reorientation and the most profound motivation in human experience. And Gary, I'm just wondering if you could explain what that means to you. You know, um, yeah, that... First of all, let me just say that uh, Oz Guinness's book, The Call, is a great book. I would recommend it. I don't think anyone has done better than him in digging in to understand what calling is biblically and culturally and historically. But yeah, that quote, I think, captures so much because it is true that as we understand our calling, and, and we're going to talk about that, obviously, some in this, in this 20 minute or so conversation, as we understand our calling, we realize that really is the driving force in our life. It's, it's the thing that we most want to do. It's the way we think. It's what we notice. It's what we perceive. And we will eventually start to orient our life around that. I, I, I think that is such a, a profound subject. In fact, let me just say, Sam, to, to go off your introduction, you know, we're going to start with talking primarily from um, topics out of It's Your Call, about personal calling, and then subjects dealing with Sam's book, Hearing God in Conversation, because those are so profoundly important. I mean, life is about an intimate relationship with God. There's no intimacy without a conversation. And that intimacy results in, in a certain life we're to live here on earth. And that's your calling. And so we're really excited to delve into this. And we'll touch subjects outside of our books as well. So yeah, Sam, that is an amazing topic or amazing quote. So, so Gary, tell us a little bit about your own history with calling. You know, did you just get interested 10 years ago? What have you been doing personally in the pursuit of your calling and in the pursuit of calling itself, its nature? Yeah, so about probably about 28 to 30 years ago, I started in an in-depth study of calling. And it was simply because I was fascinated by the subject or, or really more personally, I was wondering about my own calling. You know, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Not simply what could I do, but what am I supposed to be doing? Who am I really? And so, you know, that started me into this pursuit of understanding calling and then eventually the desire to help others. Now, let me pause for a second and say, as we go into the subject and this and, and further uh, video stream conversations, one of the telltale signs of your calling is what are you most fascinated about? What is that question that looms in your heart um, that you want to read about it, listen to it, inquire with other people? Um, because that really is a clue into what God has put in your heart. So that has always been a fascination of mine of calling. So again, for about 28 to 30 years, I have been studying scripture on this. I have been reading biographies that touch into people's calling? Why did they become the man or woman that they did become and do the things that they did do? Um, I've talked to, as, as Sam, you have, and John, you're on this as well. I've talked to hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people about their story as they wanted to explore their own calling. Um, I've looked at my own life, again, personally, just wrestle, wrestling with the questions of my own heart. And wrestling with God, what does this mean? How do you want to speak to me about this? Do I have a calling? If I do, how, as I said, how do you speak to this? How do you reveal it? What am I to do about it? So it's been a pursuit that I've been very aware of for many, many years. Can you, Gary, can you remember the first time you sort of sat down and asked yourself, what is my calling? What, you know, is there such a thing as a calling? Do you remember what triggered all of this? 
You know, um, it probably goes back to my time in college. Um, I, I, first of all, I became a business major because my dad told me to become a business major. He said, what you need to do is get a business degree and then you need to start your own business and eventually have people work for you and, and that type of thing. That was his journey in life. That's how he was successful. So I went into college. Um, I, I remember my first class freshman year, uh, my first semester, rather, it was a, it was a um, psychology class, freshman psychology. And I was fascinated by it, just fascinated by under, trying to understand why do people do what they do? How do they think? Why are they motivated by whatever factors? And then later on in my years there, in my, my uh, business degree, I took a marketing class, several, in fact. And really what those were, they're simply business marketing classes or business psychology classes. And um, again, I was fascinated about that more than anything else. Now, I need to tell you, I didn't get a degree in psychology or counseling. Um, I didn't get a degree in marketing. I got a degree just in general business. But as I look back, I realized, gosh, those subjects captured me. I so wish that I had someone in my life say to me, Gary, what, what classes are you taking? And what are you enjoying? And then help me connect those dots. But, now, but just looking back now, I can see that was the beginning of uh, a, a revealing of my interest, my fascination with my own heart, my life. Wouldn't you say that whenever you help somebody get greater clarity on their calling, almost everybody can look back at different seasons in their life and say, oh my gosh, it was there. I see that. It was, it was being awakened there. There was a spark there. Isn't that true? So you just tell the story. You said you started studying um, calling 28, 30 years ago, but I know your age, Gary, and I know that you were in college over 28 years ago. <laughs> So, so you can look back and say, you know, the, the seeds were planted even before, before you officially started pl uh, studying it. Right, right. In fact, let me, let me just say, there's a commercial on TV lately. I think it's for, I think it's an army commercial, you know, and they have really amazing commercials on TV through the years. But, but in this commercial, so it's captured me and it's just as brand new, you know, where you see, for instance, this girl, She's, she's playing volleyball with her friends. The guy severely hurts his knee. She runs in. She gets this uh, first aid kit, runs back out to help him. And then all of a sudden she appears inside of a kind of a mash unit tent. And she sees all these patients on bed on beds. And she looks and she sees herself, you know, dressed up. She's obviously in the army. She's seeing herself as this. And the whole idea and the byline is you have a calling and we have the answer. And the reason it captured me was the whole idea is if you look back on your life, you will get glimpses of what you were to be, what you are made to be. And that, I think, was the, the, the gist of their illustration of their story in that 30-second commercial. But I think it's really true that if we look back on our life, if we have an evaluated, reflective life, we'll say, oh, my goodness, I saw myself in this situation. It might have been 20 years ago. And that was a glimpse of who I truly am. I just didn't realize it at that point. But now I can go back, put all those pictures together and say, right, this is why I'm here. This is what I'm to bring to this world. You know, I met you, Gary. It was 10 years ago last month, I think. It might have been 10 years ago, February. I can't remember. But, but 10 years ago, I know you rue the day. But um, when I was 12 years old, my family had this practice where Whenever somebody turned 12, you know, everybody would pray and they try to find a birthday card and they write some kind of note about saying what they thought God's calling on their life would be. And on my birthday card, I, on, on my birthday, I got four different cards, one for my grandparents, one for my parents, one for my brother. And I don't remember who the fourth was from. And they all basically said this. Uh, they felt like God was calling me to listen to God's people and speak to God's people. And so I thought that was my calling, you know, whatever, which meant I thought it was gonna, I was going to be a missionary or a pastor, but I did missionary work for a few years and I felt like I was saying I shouldn't do it. So I went into the business world for, gee, over 25 years. And then I felt like God called me away from the business world. And I had a set of friends who helped me sort of discern that word. Am I really you know, just wanting to leave business or is this actually God calling me? And we all felt like God was calling me, but I didn't know 
what I should do. I mean, I, and, and, you know, the thing is, is it's not enough just to know that I have a calling. I, I, you know, just to say you have purpose. I want to know what that purpose is. I want to be able to act on it. I wanted to be able to make decisions based on it. And so I met you because after a year of working with these five friends and then a year of praying on my own, I was desperate. And I really felt like there is a calling on my life. So I went to a calling retreat and that's where I met you. But Gary, it isn't enough just to say, I have a purpose, is it? Don't we want something more? Right. Right. And that, you know, that's such a powerful story. And, and so I want to say two things to that. I want to answer that question and say this. So for those of you who are listening, let me just say, if, you, if you're sitting there thinking, well, why don't I understand my calling? Why can't I look back on my life and make sense of things to know from the past, what is my present and future supposed to look like? You know, perhaps there's something wrong with me. I should get this. Perhaps I missed it. Perhaps I don't have a calling. And I just want to say to you, um, as Sam and I are talking, you know, I still wrestle continually. I'm still trying to go deeper into what is my calling. And, and of course, we'll talk about this more. What does this mean exactly? But what is the effect of my life? Why am I here? What has God uniquely given me that I bring to this world? So if, if you are feeling a little bit of, you know, hesitation or shame going, gosh, I should have figured this out like these guys have, we would both tell you, we are continually figuring this out, honing it, trying to understand more of it, the depth of it. So first of all, I want to take anything off that you feel of shame or pressure or regret or disappointment because, because the nature of calling is two things. It is the development of who we truly are in Christ, who God has made us to be, and it is relational with God. And so, of course, it's just going to take time. We, you know, we grow developmentally and we grow in our relationship with God. So there's always more to be discovered. There's not this one time epiphany and now you have it all. So, so I do want to say that right off. <laughs> now, Sam, <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> uh, I think you answered my question. My, well, it, it, it's nice to know that we have a calling. In other words, calling mm. isn't reserved just for the pastors, the missionaries, the worship leaders, or the firefighters. You know, that, that there, there's something more than a job title. There's a calling. But just knowing I have a calling, I don't think it satisfies me. I want something more. Right. Yes. Thank you. I forgot my, <laughs> that was the question. You're right. You're right. Just, just answering the question in her own heart do I have a calling is not enough. It, it truly isn't. Some people say you just have to believe it and that's all you need to know. The deeper question truly is, what specifically is my calling? How do I have a life of consequence here on earth? And, I, and of course, our life of consequence is knowing God, right? And he's, he's brought us into the kingdom. He's brought us into an intimate relationship with him. But here on earth right now, at this time, while we are in this story, the question really on our heart is so specifically, what do I bring? What is consequential? What is transcendent? What is essential? And when I die, it dies with me. What is that? And so we really do struggle at a deeper level, not simply do I have a calling and purpose, but it gets down to, you know, what is that purpose? Uh, there, there's a quote I use in the book that I think is so good. Let me just read it to you. It's, it's from Russell Baker, who is a Pulitzer Prize winner. And he said, there is a hunger in us for assurance that our lives have been not been merely successful, but valuable, that we've accomplished something grander than just another well-heeled, which is an older phrase, which means well-off, loudly publicized journey from the diaper to the shroud in short, that our lives have been consequential. And he's right. I mean, he has stated in that one thing that we all have this desire to live a consequential life. It's, it's not being self-centered. It's actually being self-aware. And it's really important to understand the difference between self-centeredness and self-awareness. That God has put something in our heart and therefore desire to live a consequential life for the kingdom. So... If our calling is to have a life of, life of consequence, of significance, of 
impact in this world where God has put us. He's, he's put you who you are, Gary, me who I am, John who he is. If we have a life of consequence, how much help is just taking, you know, the tests that businesses give us, you know, the Myers-Briggs or the, the churches would give us uh, spiritual gift inventory or other personality tests. How much help in your experience are those to, to finding that significance, that profound, that life of consequence? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm sure those who are listening have an interest in understanding who they are um, by the work of Christ and, and to the life they need to live. So I'm, so by that, I'm assuming that probably everyone listening has taken some sort of, as you're saying, personality assessments, might be Myers-Briggs, the DISC test, uh, could be the Enneagram. There's all sorts of them out there and, and probably spiritual gift tests as well. And, and what I would say is while they are helpful initially, because they do start to kind of get us down the path. They, they give us words. They give us things to look at and go, oh, my goodness, that is so true of me. I am so excited about that. I'm motivated by that. Yes, I want to do that. Or spiritual gifts. Boy, I think that's in the realm of what I would like to have true of my life as a believer in this world. The fact is it doesn't go deep enough. Those tests don't. Be, because our calling is who we truly are. And I want to get to a question that someone asked, which is right in that whole vein. Our calling is who we are. Those tests will only take us so far. In fact, let me venture to say that often I believe that many of the personality tests more than simply reveals who we are, what we're motivated to do, truly, sometimes they reveal the life that we have been trained to live by our parents, our schooling, our surroundings, our bosses in our life. And so we want to be careful with those things, not to hear what they say and say, well, that's me. I am now labeled and I'll live within that label. What I want to say is you're calling so much deeper because it is truly who you are. It is the effect that God has created you to have in this world. And it's just your life. I, I know one of the questions that John told us about was how, how can I just simply be who I am with others, and therefore they encounter my calling. Now, we're going to get far deeper into this, and we can't go that long here because of our time right now, but I do want to say that who you are can be described by the effect that you have on people. Now, there can be a bad effect, a false effect, and there can be the, the effect of the very life of Christ in you and who you are. And you've been around people where you say, gosh, when I'm with that person, I feel so safe. When, I, when I'm with that person, I feel encouraged. When I'm with that person, I discover clarity about my life or God or this world. When I'm with this person, you know, I, I feel, I, I sense that I am an artist, that I have something to bring. And you can say this in a thousand ways, but that's truly the effect and the calling of a person's life. And that's why it's so important that we simply discover who we are in Christ truly. And we live that around people. That is, in essence, uh, living our calling in this world. So, Gary, part of what you were just talking about, I, I really love that you alluded to this because um, you were talking about the fact that oftentimes our personality tests reflect partly how we were trained uh, by our parents, teachers, coaches, or, or I, I would say how we've reacted to them, which you know we might have gone in the opposite direction, but again, it isn't our true self. And in your book, you remind us of the story of C.S. Lewis's story in the Silver Chair, where there's this search for a Prince Rillian, and finally Puddleglum and uh, oh my goodness, I can't remember the two other characters. I can't believe I forget them. But anyway, they find Prince Rillian. He's been enchanted. And whenever he was enchanted, he would lose the recollection of himself. He forgot who he was. But once, well, for one hour every day, he would be tied down in a chair. And then this is a quote when he was discussed, Prince Willian is describing himself. He said, while I was enchanted, I could not remember my true self. During my brief moments of clarity, and this is when the witch actually told him that these, these moments were insanity, but he, he recognized they were clarity, not insanity. Um, 
he would be bound to a chair until he came back into his right mind, which he described being bound in that chair, he said, was a heavy, tangled, cold, clammy web of evil magic. And what he needed was a disenchantment. And, and I, I, part of what I hear you saying is to find our calling, oftentimes we need a bit of a disenchantment from, from really all those other things that we've been made to be. I think so many people think their calling is about happiness or fame, notoriety maybe, um, appreciation, applause, being needed or noticed. But what do you think about people's calling being happiness, notoriety, fame, appreciation, being liked? Yeah. Yeah. I, I love, I love the term disenchantment, right? To, to get out of the enchantment that's been put on us by this world, because we know scripture says there is an enchantment this world puts on us. You know, the world, the, the scripture calls it worldliness. We're very unaware of it when we're living in it. It just seems this is how life is supposed to be. And this is what I'm supposed to have. And this is what I'm supposed to feel. And this is what it's about. And so we have to get out of that worldliness, be disenchanted so we can see who we really are why we're here. And, and, and there is a depth of joy that can only be experienced as we walk with God and who we are in this world. Another great dis word, not only disenchantment, but disillusioned. Uh -huh. uh, that means to lose our illusions, kind of the same thing, enchantments and illusions. You know, the illusions that the world gives us about what is happiness and what does it mean to be a, a mature person in this world, a fulfilled person. But yes, I, I think some people believe their calling is, if they live in their calling, they'll be happy all the time. They'll be recognized, validated, appreciated. And that's really far more self-centeredness than it is calling. Now, and, and again, as you had said, when we were talking about there, there is a true deep fulfillment as we walk in who we truly are. But, but that is always about the, the blessing, the benefit, the growth of other people. And, and that often can turn sour on us. So there, there is, yes, I think there is this false calling that people pursue and they do think it's about their happiness and, and that type of thing. You know, there, there, was a great, there was a great question on here. And excuse me, I just have to look at it because I forgot it already. Um, the question was, when in life do you think it's important for someone to discern their calling? That is a great question. Uh, and Sam, I want you to answer this as well. Let me start by saying, I think it is, it is a, a, a never ending journey in our life to discern our calling. I'm still discerning my calling. The difference between me right now at my age of 63 and when I was referring back to my college years where I became a Christian is I have so much more to put together this point. I have more to discern and understand. But I think as soon as possible, we need to start looking for those clues, you know, those, those bits of information that God is giving us about who we really are and what he has put in our heart. And again, those are going to be the kind of conversations that we're going to go into in future ones. One, because we're out of time right now, because they really are, it's a future topic for us as well. But it's a great question. You know, Gary, I would say, I, I mean, I agree. I think that it's important to try to discern our calling at, at every stage of our life. I, I was telling the story of being 12 years old and getting these birthday cards from family and friends. And I think it was helpful for me to get that at age 12, because if calling is about our whole life, it's not just a little compartmentalized part, but if it's about who we are, then it's gonna help us make decisions. And I used the little bit of information I had from age 12 and then 15 and then 20 to help make college decisions, to make other decisions. I feel like now as, as, I, as I grew in, if, if, if I could show you my understanding of my calling from age 12 to age 20 to age 30 to age 50 to age 60, I think you'd find that they were remarkably consistent and remarkably sharper. And, and so I wouldn't say I was wrong when I was age 12. Uh, and I think that it was a very, helpful guide to help me say, okay, I'm going to eliminate this career. I'm going to eliminate this activity and I'm going to pour more into this career or this activity. Um, so I think it was helpful for that stage. I think God gives us manna, which means God gives us enough bread for today, but he doesn't always give us enough bread for 30 years from today. And so I think the more we understand our calling at each 
stage of our life, the more we have God's help, God's presence, God's intimacy to help us make the decisions that we're facing that day. And, and then tomorrow he's going to give us more clarity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, as we talk about, you know, it's important that we walk in what God has shown us up to this point because he will show us more. And, and in fact, walking in what we know of who we are, the effect that God has created us to have in this world, the world around us, um, as we walk in that, then the next thing he shows us, we will understand. If we don't walk in what we've shown, what he's shown us, then we will not understand the next thing. And I, and I see in a lot of cases in scripture, he will not share the next thing until, as James talks about, we have, we have looked in the mirror, seen who we are, and we've lived it out. We've obeyed it. So, you know, one thing we talk about all the time, Sam, is we talk about this idea of God will continue to give us uh, bits of information, intel about who we really are how he's created us, what he's put in our heart. And we need a collection basin for those things, which, you know, we refer to as a journal, you know, so that as God reveals things to us, and again, we'll go into how does he reveal it? We're, you know, we'll talk about books and movies and conversations, and of course, scripture and time alone with God and speaking. We need to collect those things because more understanding comes as we start to have a number of bits of information that we start to connect. So it's really important that we keep a journal, we keep those things, and then we help other people. Uh, we have other people help us understand and connect those things to see context for those things as well. Absolutely. I, one of the people made a comment that said, calling can be and is very disruptive. And I, and I really like that line because I would say in a deepest sense, calling is just bringing us more to who we are, you know? So in that sense, it doesn't sound disruptive, but the thing is, is we keep going off on these little tangents in our lives and, and God often disrupts us to get, to get us back. You know, Moses is a great example where he's raised in Pharaoh's court. So he's raised with the nobility. He learns how to lead an army. He leads, learns how to do administration. And then he just blows it in a, in a very hot moment of where he murders somebody. And then he feels like he's on, he feels like he's on plan B or C or D or sidelined and God wakes him up. He disrupts him to you, Jim's comment. He disrupts him with this burning brush. You know, it's this curiosity, it's this mystery, this, it's this, uh, one commentator says, it's a detour. God takes Moses on a detour to get him back on the right path. And so I love the line about it being disruptive, but it's always God bringing us back to who we are. Gary, somewhere you have a quote from Soren Kierkegaard which I think is a terrific way of summing up calling. I can't remember what the call it, quote is though. Yeah, so Søren Kierkegaard said, now with God's help, I shall become myself. It's so powerful. Now, because there's a context, obviously, to, to a book that he had that quote in, but he's basically saying, with God's help, you will become the man, the woman that God created you to be in the very beginning, that got sidelined by disobedience and sin and all, but he's going to bring you back to that to be that person. And, and what's so important about that is right with God's help, you shall become who God's made you to be, not somebody else, because you know, how much in our life do we aspire to be someone else, uh, a speaker, a singer, a writer, a pastor, a missionary, a counselor, and, and, and on it goes. But again, going back to this idea, which is a great kind of ending point with God's help, I shall become myself because you are your calling. Your calling is who you truly are. Well, thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Next week, we are going to, you know, we're saying it's a different topic. We're talking about my book on hearing God and conversation. We want to help everybody grow in hearing God. But honestly, I don't think we're going to find our calling without hearing God, because, because to find out who we truly are, we have to be disenchanted. And God is doing that as he speaks to us. And, and I think that the more we are walking in our calling, the more we're walking who God made us to be, the more we're going to hear God. So I encourage everybody to join us again next week at eight o'clock Eastern time, you know, then seven, six, five central mountain and Pacific. Um, and I can't remember what time it is in Australia. Sorry. Somebody asked me, um, but we really look forward to seeing you next week. And we thank you for joining us. And we thank you for all the questions. So see you all next week. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Great to be with you, John. Thank you for helping us also.